With the End of the Death Volume 3 coming to a close, we finally have the single largest war in the history of the Imperium, mostly, and I do mean mostly complete, since we know that we have the final Bequin novel and a lot of other promising stuff in the pipeline. But naturally, I think it's only rational that we move on from the biggest war the Imperium has ever faced over to the second biggest war that's ever been fought, that of the Rangdan Xenocides, or the Rangdan Crusade. From what little sources that we have, we do know that the Rangda was a major player in the galactic stage, operating out of the Halo Stars, or more specifically, the northwestern part of the borders of the Imperium. So the Rangdan were such a threat to the Imperium that we lost a Primarch? a legion and over a quarter of a million of the Emperor's Angel. Easily the largest battle outside of the Horacy. It's probably best to start with scale, as it took three separate crusades or xenocides depending on the presenter, and the forces brought to bear against the Rangdan is truly staggering. Nine Space Marine legions in total, the Dark Angels, Space Wolves, Warhounds, who are the world eaters before Angron, Death Guard, White Scars, Raven Guard, Alpha Legion, as well as both the Lost and the Damned Legion. It's also worth noting that we don't know what they look like, what they eat, or even how they produce. And yes, knowing humanity, I know at least one sick bastard who would try and sleep with an alien, and uh, yeah, that's me. I'm that sick bastard. They are referred to as either the Rangdan Cerebvores and the Rangdan Osseovores meeting skull or head eating and bone eating respectively. Now physiologically they have been described as anything from Lovecraftian horrors to fish people to like jellyfish things but uh, more on that later. I'm going to be breaking this up into three parts with each part being presented as the forces of the wider Departmental Munitorum would see it or recognize it. 839.m31 The first Rangdan Xenocide. From data cores recovered from the Forge world of Zana 2, we know that the Imperium of Man first came across the Advex Moor system. It was the first legion, the Dark Angels, led by their Primarch Lion L. Johnson at the head. Upon Zana 2, the Dark Angels, as well as a combined force of over 100,000 auxiliary elements of both Tegmata and Imperial Army, 50,000 Dark Angels were at the head of this force with over 100 capital class ships and three Gloriana class battleships leading the way. One of those Gloriana class battleships being the invincible reason. The first Rangdan Xenocide truly began with the assault on the capital system of Advex Moor. When the wedge or the spear tip broke through the warp into the Advex Moor system, it wasn't only Xenos who greeted them, but humans too. To the horror of Imperial fighter pilots, they fielded strange weaponry theorized to be rad-based weapons and often called shadow blasters that left a miasma of radiation that took a deadly toll on the imperial navy this in concert with energy shields and propulsion that were pushed to a truly reckless extent this however is the imperium and they haven't figured out how to reverse engineer brakes yet Despite the heavy losses inflicted, the expeditionary fleet kept pushing to Advex Moore's Extremis, and with the Grand Master of the First Legion, Giga Chad Urien Vendrig I, at the head. To the horror of the Imperium, it was discovered that there was only one Rangda on this planet, defending a single factory garrisoned by a small horde of slave soldiers. For over three hours, the Imperium steamrolled the slave forces, taking minimal losses. Well, minimal for the Great Crusade. If a chapter lost 200 Marines today, they may as well go extinct, or just merge with another chapter. Back on the topic of the Rangda though, they seem to have built their entire empire off of the subjugation and exploitation of slaves, as they spent lives without any regards for the mindless drones to protect the single Rangda on the planet. These overlords, as they would come to be known, had complete control over the various slave races through a collar or some sort of nerve stapler. The four outer worlds of the Advex Moor system were scoured in a similar manner to the first engagement on Advex Moor's Extremis as the Dark Angels assessed their adversary. The four outer worlds had been mostly abandoned by the time the Imperial fleet approached the capital world of the system and what could only be described as a battle moon. This venerable bulwark looked as though it had been shackled to the will of the planet itself with its entire surface was coated in a formidable carapace and energy shield array capable of withstanding the Imperium through its way. And while comparing the two, its armament far outmatched the Imperium in almost every way. 
The battle moon had been garrisoned only by slaves, not a single Rangda stood within its carapace. Only the unfortunate meat puppets who had been mentally and physically controlled or piloted by the Rangda garrisoning Advex Mors Primus. Up to the invasion of the capital planet, only a handful of true Rangda had been killed. Only an uncounted number of drone slaves of the various slave species who would become lab rats to these aquatic abominations. The plan for the initial assault on the attack moon was a large fleet attack of focused fire to create an opening for a small force to infiltrate the bastion. This, however, did not work, as the Rangda actually cared about this planet and it shone clear as day to the First Legion. This was a war of attrition. Any firepower the Imperial fleet brought to bear against the attack moon failed miserably as its energy shielding absorbed all but the largest of macro cannon rounds. After heavy losses were inflicted on the defense fleet of Advex Mors Primus, with the Imperium suffering equally, it was decided they needed a radical change of plan, and the battleship Paradigm of Hate made full thrust towards the battle moon. Acting as if it were a spear tip, the defense fleet scattered as the glowing and raging inferno that was the Paradigm of Hate cut deep into the surface of the battle moon until she grinded to a violent halt. The crew aboard the Sacrifice Gloriana class battleship had created an opening, and they had intended to make the most of it. The First Legion contingent aboard planned to rig the ship's reactor to blow and set up defensive positions accordingly. It was here where the true fangs of the Rangdun menace were shown to the Imperium. As massive creatures later identified as different phenotypes, both Cerebvores and Osseovores, the elite of these warriors had protective energy shielding on top of extremely advanced weaponry and armor. Towering above their meat puppets and unleashing a barrage of radioactive hellfire, the Rangda sent forth detachments to purge the quickly diminishing Imperial forces, but to no avail. Eventually, the battleship reactor exploded and a ripple ran across the surface of the entire moon, silencing the behemoth. To call it a cloud of debris in orbit would not be an accurate assessment, as a venerable nebula of shrapnel and flame erupted from the surface of the battlement, giving the Imperial fleet a chance to finally focus on the planet. Through more hard-fought void battles, the two remaining Gloriana-class battleships broke orbit and managed to create an opening for a hail of drop pods inbound to a spot away from the fortresses and defense platforms which blotted its surface. Smaller squadrons of transports and gunships strafed the various columns of slaves sent to investigate the crash as well as smaller fortresses which dotted its equatorial plane. With each day that passed, hundreds of Astartes met their end as the unwavering resolve and strength of the elite warriors of the Rangda slowly unraveled their secrets to their adversary. Grandmaster Vendrick had come to understand the Rangdon menace completely, though the Legion had paid a good man for every secret gain. 30,000 Space Marines moved towards the fortress bastions that remained dotting the planet's equator, and the Rangda answered in the same way they always had. Slaves first, until a weakness is found, and then exploit that weakness with overwhelming force. That tactic may have worked for lesser races, but this was humanity, and more importantly, the First Legion. As they burst through the walls of slaves, not allowing the advantage to the enemy, the proud Rangda met their human adversaries head-on, despite having the assault turned against their favor. It is said that it was an even fight, both sides comparable in skill and power, both sides unrelenting in their hatred. When Uriel Vendrick finally met the Rangda general in a fury of cuts and dodges, the neurotoxin lace blade of the Rangda menace and its massive strength bore down on the chapter master, who despite having his armor broken and being battered physically, Uriel had finally won the duel and held the severed head of the Rangda high for all to see. Following this, what remaining forces loyal to the Rangda, fled to the other distant bastions, if only to buy themselves more time. Despite the inevitable hammer striking the anvil, over the coming months, the entire Advex Moor system was systematically purged of all remaining Rangda. The remains of the attack moon were slowly and painfully cleared, as well as combed the ever-increasing nebula of shrapnel that danced around the system. With around 10,000 Dark Angels and 50 Imperial ships of the line completely destroyed, the Dark Angels had left a bloody scar on the galaxy. A reminder for all that the Dark Angels would not relent 
even when the costs were great. Ultimately, the Dark Angels sacrificed many men and the title of the largest legion. Never again would they rise to such a peak. If you wish to see the zenith of the Dark Angels, you must simply go to Advex Moors. Rangdan Xenocide 2 Electric Boogaloo 862.m30 at first, what was believed to be a rogue solar system had begun to make its way into the northeastern boundary of the Imperium. In its wake was left nothing but the cold quiet of the void. It wasn't until multiple Imperial systems had gone completely silent, and the threat pushed ever inward, that the Imperium finally looked into the eyes of death itself. The Rangda had come seeking nothing more than to stamp out those ignorant fools who had destroyed their westernmost boundary. Upon first contact with Imperial Navy assets, it was confirmed that what can truly only be described as a miniature solar system was no celestial phenomena, but in fact the gaping maw of the true Rangdan menace. Dozens of battle moons escorted by thousands of ships of all sizes, battleships, cruisers, frigates, corvettes, and a haze of millions of strike craft orbiting the ever-approaching tide. What had once acted as a staging ground for the scouring of Advex Moors soon experienced rage and hellfire unlike anything seen before. Over eight months, the Raven Guard and White Scars garrisoned within the Manufactorums and Havelocks learned the true horror that had only previously been the burden of the Dark Angels. Through heavy losses, the White Scars and Raven Guard slowly adapted to the strategies of these new and most vile Xenos. Waves of enslaved humans and Xenos alike threw themselves at the Imperial Defenders with nothing but blinding hate and rage behind their eyes. As if they had called upon all of their allies, new and old foe alike reared their nasty head. The Sloth, nothing more than parasites on the material realm who would drink the essence of a mortal and leave him as nothing more than a gaunt, skeletal husk. Accompanying them were the base Mechaniths, Goliath beasts who were more akin to a siege engine than any thinking creature, as these beasts would hurl themselves into any Imperial line in an attempt to punch a hole clean through for the Rangdan to exploit. Fortunately for the Rangda, and at the behest of the Imperial defenders, the Raven Guard and White Scars Legion had not been privy to the secrets held by their eldest brethren, the First Legion. Dark Angels, much like their Primarch the Lion, held their secrets and tactics close to heart, and never share any information unless absolutely necessary. When a combined force of Dark Angels and Death Guard finally broke the blockade, bringing expertise in fighting those vile Xenos, the tide quickly changed, and the formerly Siege Zana II once more became a beachhead for a push into Rangdon space. What followed was a two-decade-long war in which most records remained hazy at best, with very few pick feeds remaining and rumors of a misprint within the Imperial Guardsmen's uplifting primer. We know for certain that countless Imperial worlds were stripped of both man and material, and 19 systems were left uninhabitable. At the height of this conflict, the Lion himself led a force of at least 300,000 of the Emperor's Angels to reap a bloody tithe upon the world of Texal. It was clear to the Imperium almost immediately that these Xenos were anathema to all the Imperial Creed stood for. This race was to be purged from both map and memory, with veterans silenced or sent to the Emperor's side with the grace of a smoking barrel. With complete silence on the matter and the passing of ten millennia, much has been lost in the way of historical fact. We know for certain that three Primarchs at one point were engaged in the wider conflict, yet the Lion receives all the credit. But through questionable sources and some unfortunate misprints, we have scant records and pics of the horrors that unfolded. We know that it was revealed to one of the redacted Primarchs, almost right before they disappear from Imperial record, that the Emperor had been using massive and terribly powerful psychic weapons and using the power of the warp to keep his Great Crusade marching ever forward. I personally believe the Emperor would kill a Primarch to keep such a secret, as he already has multiple sons who will carry out his will without question, such as the Lion and Lehman Russ 
Not to mention, he has both Magnus and Mortarion who he can mold into his ideal psychers. We also know that when these psychic weapons failed and no power drawn from the warp could help to prevent the onslaught of the Rangda, the Emperor of Mankind, with near limitless psychic abilities, was forced to release a prisoner who had been shackled within Mars for countless millennia, a shard of the greatest of the Catan the being known as the Void Dragon. The Catan began lashing out at the Rangda with the ferocity only matched by the blood god Korn himself. As quickly as he was released, the Void Dragon was once more imprisoned within Mars, and the Emperor returned to his crusading duties. Thus began a slow and methodical purging of every rock and every glittering of shrapnel brought to bear against the Imperium. Over a decade, with the combined strength of nine legions, the Emperor's angels strode ever forward towards the northeastern fringes. Through bloody attritional warfare, the proud Rangda and their Xeno allies bled for every inch they had foolishly believed belonged to them. After an Imperial Expeditionary Fleet chanced upon a battered Rangda fleet that was limping back to its own space, the Second Rangdan War, or Xenocide, officially came to an end. Upon its conclusion, only a select handful of Dark Angels were entrusted with the memories of these abominations. The Order of the Broken Claws was formed to stand vigil over the formerly occupied Rangdan space. With anatomical data, and more than likely a Rangdusi or two hanging around, Relics of old were first entrusted to the protections of the veterans of the Second Rangdon War. But over time, all of these men would be lost, and soon, all who stood vigil over Advex Moors and what had once been Rangdon space never had seen a Rangda, never understood the threat that had once held the knife edge just above the throat of the Imperium. The Third and Final Rangdan Crusade, the Rangdan Xenocide. Despite being the most recent in history, the Third Rangdan War, or the True Rangdan Xenocide, is the least known of these three campaigns. We only know as much as we do about the First and Second Wars because of the records on the Forge World of Zana II, as well as vague references within the Orders of the Ever Elusive Dark Angels. What little records from Zana II that we do have confirm that the Third War was a large-scale conflict that did indeed push all the way to the capital planet of the Rangda Menace in the Rangda system. All that remains of these deployments, however, are the names of the Titan Houses involved, as well as the accolades that they achieved. Black Library, or the publishing branch of GW, also has an issue with the Xenocide, since they keep altering the timeline and events during the Great Crusade. I know this is pretty difficult to keep on top of when you have as big of a collaborative writing project as Warhammer 40k is, but it could be a lot less confusing. It wasn't until the early 2010s when GW finally started delving into the Great Crusade, expanding on a lot of the conflicts the individual Primarchs were forged in. In 2012, with the book Betrayal, we started to see a connection between the Sloth Murder Mines and the Rangda, as it is directly mentioned that they were fighting alongside the Rangda on the capital planet of, surprise surprise, Rangda wherein a Warhound Dreadnought was incapacitated by these very same murder mines. One year later, in 2013 in the book Massacre, it said that the Salamanders were fighting a desperate war against the Orcs, as every other force able to be brought to bear was forced on the Rangda Menace. In 2017, it is first referenced that the Emperor is forced to open the Noctis Labyrinth, containing the Void Dragon, or the Labyrinth of Night, up until the release of Inferno in 2017, the Rangda were seen as a very serious threat, but it's revealed only now that they almost toppled the Imperium, and only a desperate Hail Mary from the Emperor of Man himself actually saved the Imperium. Also within Inferno is where we see the first potential alliance, or at the very least a neutral third party swooping in to take advantage of the carnage wrought by the Enslavers. I have a fun theory about them that I'm going to put in the next video, but that's for another time. Two years later, in First Legion, we get the first descriptions of fish people, or jellyfish people. It's described as Drukhari-like, but I prefer fish people because I can fit in some HP Lovecraft references. Within First Legion, we also get the first mention that the Dark Angels are making a serious push into Rangdon space. However, the losses this time are significantly worse than the Advex Moors campaign. After almost seven years of hyping up the Rangda, in a book that I completely forgot to write down in the script, 
Uh, the Rangda are now relegated to just a problem for the Dark Angels, and within the span of a decade, the entire Great Crusade, as well as all of the major events that we had come to love before this, such as the Xenocides or the Ulanor campaign, had changed dramatically. And granted, while this does give us the reader a lot of fun theories that we can weave together depending on whatever books we've read or whatever media we've consumed, it is also extremely confusing. Two of the best sources for the entirety of the third Xenocide are the Dark Angels and the Alpha Legion, both of which are notoriously unreliable sources with the Dark Angels having levels of secrecy extending infinitely in each direction, and the entire shtick of the Alpha Legion is just, hey, are we lying or not? Thankfully, we have records outside of the Alpha Legion that corroborate that Alpharius and Omegon were reunited on the Rangda Overrun planet, and that Alpharius had to allow for Omegon to be discovered as all the others had been, with the proper dignities and celebrations, even though at number 20, this was quite rehearsed, and everyone was just very happy they didn't have to do this again. This was also the first time that the Alpha Legion had been seen as a complete legion to the rest of their brother warriors. They had previously been involved in clandestine operations within Rangda occupied space, and would appear as grey, iconless hulks leaving as quickly as they arrived. For certain, we know that after the Rangdan Xenocides, Lehman Russ, or Father Furry himself, is widely known as the Emperor's Executioner, as it is only said after this point that he and his legion are designed to be the counter to Astartes or the Astartes killers. Essentially, if you need a legion chapter or any size gathering of space marines that need to be dealt with after the Rangda Crusade, you call the Space Wolves. While sources vary wildly from a slaughter of an already battered and beaten foe, some claim a bloody attritional campaign that absolutely ravaged the Dark Angels. I once more have to side with the records from Zana 2. We know for certain that during the first and second wars with the Rangda, that mere human and Xeno thralls piloting their weapons of war with damn near suicidal zeal could inflict devastating losses to multiple Imperial armadas. I truly can't believe that they wouldn't have any ships in reserve or defending their trade routes. If we are to assume, though, that they did bring even 99% of their naval capacity into their push southwest during the Second War, they would still have billions and billions of strike craft around each planet, as well as the infrastructure to essentially print these out with the ease that we produce cars today. In the late 890s of M30, we do have a shaky agreement of sorts between sources that the extermination or purging of both Rangda and Imperial worlds of the like happened at a massive scale. This level of purge is said to be on the level of an orc infestation, complete and total incineration. No stone was left unturned, and all of the atmospheres were choked with the ashen cries of countless souls. Notably, the two main sources differ wildly here on how the war actually started. Either the White Scars easily vanquished the Rangda threat, or the Dark Angels and Space Wolves fought a bloody war of attrition, losing over 50,000 of the Emperor's Angels. I choose to favor the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels once again being led by their Primarch, as that is what we have the most references to, and the Order of the Broken Claws wasn't disbanded. Some of the notable battles during the Third Xenocide include Bar Savor, where the previously mentioned reunion and unveiling of the Alpha Legion occurred. Bar Savor is notable not only for the Alpha Legion, but also a large mention of the Sloth Murder Mines. The Dark Angels gained a fierce reputation during the seventh week-long Battle of Moro, where only three companies of Dark Angels held against a literal weight of human and Xeno slaves. So many bodies were thrown against the Dark Angels at this time that the regality of how much mass the Rangda had truly held back, and that even a meager equivalent of a planetary defense force could inflict 90% losses to the First Legion. Lesser known but no less bloody battles include the Great Citadel of Vorskag, and a massive space battle over Morsair, which left a beautiful haze of shrapnel to forever be pulled along by the winds of the void. With lesser legions, these losses might have deterred them from advancing or given them time for thought or reconsideration. But for the warriors of the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves, to waver in the face of duty was damn near unthinkable. And as the ever-tightening noose of the Imperium closed on the Rangdun Menace, it was the Rangda who realized upon their homeworld 
that it was not the Imperium who looked death into the eyes, but the Rangda, Titan Legions, the Emperor's Angels, and all arms available across all branches of the Imperium were accounted for on the Rangda home system. As the final assault on Rangda Primus began, Imperial Navy assets would begin to fan out, conducting one of the largest systemic purges in Imperial record. An area the size of a segmentum was diligently and completely purged of all life, not allowing for a single life pod or battered space hulk to escape their cleansing. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Uh, just wanted to say thank you really for the support on the first video. It is objectively the strongest of the three or four in the series because it is what we have the most concrete facts on because of records of the Dark Angels and the Order of the Broken Claws. Um, next video though, it's going to be literally just a schizophrenic rant about all of the various theories and how I rank them as well as what the Xenocides are even based off of. But anyways, Thanks for watching, guys. Have a nice day. So now that we've gone over all the facts of the Rangdan Xenocides, now I get to have a schizophrenic meltdown and get to go over some of my favorite theories I came across while researching. I'll also be going into how it's supported by the lore, and I'll be ranking them on coolness, creativity, as well as how likely they are to show up in the setting. Now, you can't talk about the Imperium without talking about Rome. The inspiration for a lot of the style and literature for the early Imperium, and even in modern times with the Ultramarines, I won't go into the Blueberry Boys, but my favorite example of the Roman Empire being the Imperium and vice versa is the Rangda and Xenocides. We know that the three Rangda Wars are based off from the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage. We also know that each one of the wars represented a different stage in the development of the Roman Navy. So the Indomitus class battleship crashing into the Battle Moon on Advex Mors Primus was a direct example of how the Romans initially used stolen designs and adapted them later on to the Roman strategy. The Romans in this case had copied the design of a Carthaginian Quirinquirin, which was a type of small galley ship, specifically a ramming ship, that they would attach a battle ladder to, which would compensate for their shit naval capabilities. My favorite metaphor of the first Rangdan Crusade is exactly that. The Indomitus class battleship crashing into the battle moon was the writer's way of not directly saying, hey look, it was Rome, but yeah, they could slide it in pretty sly. To say that the Romans at the start of the Punic Wars sucked at naval combat was an understatement. They had relied extremely heavily on the ram and board strategy during the first two Punic Wars, much like how the Imperium loves to send boarding torpedoes so that their super soldier Astartes and specifically trained naval armsmen can board the ship and clear it with more precision than any munition that the Imperium fields. Now this may be my inner English teacher speaking now, but the Rangdan Xenocides are my absolute favorite metaphors for the Roman Empire, especially since the first Xenocide was essentially just the Imperium learning combined arms void combat at a great cost, and learning how to fight absolute masters of void combat who also conveniently outmaneuvered the Imperium and disregarded all life that wasn't deemed important by a higher power. The second Punic War was when an absolutely massive naval force arrived on the Roman doorstep and both empires nearly collapsed just fighting the war. Neither economies could keep up with the sheer scale of the conflict for the time. With Rome building itself completely around militarism, it had weathered the storm far better. And the third Xenocide, or Punic War in this case, was when the Romans followed the Carthaginians home and absolutely slaughtered them. So to continue comparing the Rangda and the Carthaginians, both sides' commanders fought absolutely vicious battles with zero regard for them or their men's life because, especially in the case of Carthage, if you failed and you lived, you may as well just not come back. Coming back as a failure to Carthage means that you were killed on the spot, taking a page right out of Perturabo's book. But for the time being, I will put my inner English teacher aside, put him right over on the shelf over there, and we can stop comparing the Xenocides and the Punic Wars and stop talking about metaphors. English class is behind us. Starting with speculation, and all of this is in no particular order, we have the most bare bones of all of the theories. We have the Rangda just discovered a flaw in the Primarchs of the Astartes, much like uh, foe and his Astartes killer virus, or maybe they were able to mind control the Lost Primarchs. Neither Chaos nor the Imperium would want to acknowledge that, or let that information get out. Sadly, I have to rank this a 3 out of 10, because it is extremely boring. Uh, it's also super hard to disprove, it's got no substance, and there's 
No, no doubt. One of the most popular theories in the community is one or both of the missing Primarchs found out that they were made out of warp sauce and started trying to ascend to Godhood. Chaos and the Emperor don't want any more big players in the warp, so they try to keep it under wraps. Decent, since we do know that they discovered about the psychic weapons used by the Emperor, but this would also explain the two Primarchs and not their legion, since we know that the Ultramarines conveniently got a massive increase in both manpower and materiel, which, no, that's it's not weird. The Ultramarines having a legion size of almost 300,000 makes perfect sense. Ultramar is a realm with 500 worlds. No other legion could maintain that level of consistent, high quality recruits, since they have damn near a quadrillion imperial souls within Gilliman's personal segmentum. This one gets a 7 out of 10 for being a really cool idea, but sadly I don't think it's very likely, so it gets a 3 in that aspect. My absolute favorite theory is that the Rangda, the Sloth, and the Enslavers are all technically one species, with the Sloth being like the Hunters in Halo worms that can come together to form something that is significantly more than the sum of its parts. Since we already know that during the scouring of Advex Moors there were multiple different phenotypes, and with how similar they look, the different phenotypes of the Rangda in this case would be essentially juvenile or adolescent colonies that hadn't right quite reached the maturity level that the Sloth have. This would also explain why the Sloth are damn near extinct now, as all of their younglings have been culled. Personally, I love this one, it gets a 10 out of 10 for creativity, it's my favorite theory, but I really don't think GW is going to do anything with it. The most boring and simple theory that also is well liked among the community is that the Rangda were simply a peaceful federation of humans and Xenos that refused the Imperial will. This wouldn't be too far of a stretch since we already know of the Interrex, the Solemnar cult, the Capiculu Continuum, the list goes on. All of them more or less received the same size 80 Oromite boot in their ass from the Emperor one way or another. This one gets a 0 out of 10 for creativity because it's just taking another story and making it this one, but sadly it is one of the most likely, so it gets a 6 in that aspect. One of the more likely ones is that the Rangda were simply a species of psychic nulls, or blanks. We know that the Sloth are negative warp entities, and we know that the Rangda had complete control of multiple species by some means, even though it's still pretty clear that it was some sort of nerve stapler or mind control collar. Together, along with a few other particularly nasty races, they formed a coalition or some sort of alliance based solely off of slave labor of the lesser races. Some of the races that we saw through the Xenocides who would appear to work with or for this Federation are the base mechanic, the enslavers, and the hellspawn void forms. This gets an 8 for creativity and a 5 for how likely we are to see it, as this would actually explain a lot of the quote-unquote cooperation of the Sloth and the Rangda. The last theory that I'm going to mention posits that the Sloth were actually the real powerhouse of the Rangda, and that after the horrifying losses of their entire armada in the second Xenocide, the Sloth outright abandoned them, deeming them unworthy, and just allowing them to completely fade out of existence. I give this one an 8 for creativity and a 4 for likeliness. Even though this one isn't a far stretch since they literally mind control everyone and everything at any opportunity, but still, it's not very likely. I feel like a really good spot to end this whole series on is with the quote that really inspired me to make this whole series. Um, this is a passage from the Horus Heresy Black Book number 7, Inferno, from page 133. Forbidden to all, save one. The exact genesis of the experiments which led to the creation of the Ordo Sinister is difficult to pin down by scholarly observers in this latter age. As with almost all that began in the prohibited vaults of the Emperor's own laboratory complex beneath the Imperial Palace on Terra, its nature remains sealed by time and by the destruction that was to follow. Such records that do remain within the Martian Mechanicum, however, who given the nature of the Ordo Sinister's origins, were seriously perturbed by the project, or more accurately, their exclusion from it, do evidence certain speculations that it was arrived at either as a tangent of what was to come the Emperor's greater work in the control and manipulation of the Psyker Factor in human evolution, or as a direct attempt to develop esoteric weaponry on the macro scale to combat certain encountered menaces which had proven terrible in the cost of their destruction. These menaces, such as the Enslaver Alpha Incursions, the Rangdan Asiavors, and the Hellspawn Void Forms, 
all of which had taken the lives of millions of soldiers and thousands of star vessels to combat, and had broken whole expeditionary fleets and titan legions in the past, were menaces to which no sure counter existed, save that of Exterminatus. The purpose of what became the Ordo Sinister was the battlefield employment of macro-level weaponry, of terrible potency, and of a nature which was expressly forbidden to any within the Imperium be they Primarch or Planetary Governor, on pain of death. These were weapons born of the Dark Age of Technology, and perhaps ancient relics of civilizations which had risen and fallen before life had even begun on primeval Terra. Weapons forbidden to all but those under the Emperor's direct shadow and control, and even then only under the greatest possible conditions of secrecy and failsafe. The Ordo Sinister was the cadre set up to build, maintain, and use these weapons, classed, as their name suggests, Sinistrum. This word has long stood as the Terran Tech Arcana classification for prohibited technologies designed to artificially amplify or weaponize the Psyker's gift, usually at the cost of the Psyker themselves, body or mind. And examples such as the Kulexine shackles used by the narco-enslaved Psyker covens of the Caucasus waste subjected by the Emperor during the Unification Wars had long since been bywords for the evil of the Dark Age of Technology.